nationalisme, c'est la guerre. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. My name is Ilko Bos van Rosenthal. I will be moderating this event. Thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, it's called The Populist Turn, uh, part one. Uh, tonight at 7 p.m. at the same place, we will talk uh, in uh, part two of The Populist Turn. Tonight, we'll look a little more at the lessons of populism, uh, the steps that are next. In the next hour and a half, we'll mostly focus on the, the east-west divide in Europe when it comes to uh, populism. The timing could hardly be any better. Uh, yesterday the uh, Italian government uh, was installed two populist parties, Lega and the Five Star Movement, um, starting an experiment in, in one of the founding nations of Europe. An experiment uh, that we haven't seen before. Um, I'm sure we'll, we'll discuss Italy, which has been a bellwether in the past um, when it comes to some political development. So it's going to be interesting to look at that. Uh, we have the situation in Poland, we have the situation in Hungary. There are plenty of reasons to talk about populism in Europe uh, and we will do so. We have three fantastic keynote speakers tonight which I'll introduce um, in a couple of minutes. But I would like to start with Desi Gavrilova from Bulgaria. She's the founder and chairwoman of the European Network of Houses for Debate called Time to Talk. Uh, this program is part of a series on populism organized by her network and also by the Open Society Initiative for Europe. So let's talk a little bit about the populist turn. So please welcome Desi Gavrilova. My, my, my first question for you is why did you start with the project? That was exactly what I was going to talk about. Good afternoon. Um, I know you love people delaying the start of the real debate, but I had to respond to the polite invitation to tell you, give you a little bit of the background about these debates that we are doing as a network of houses for debate across Europe. We are doing debates about understanding the populist turn. We call them the X debates in five countries, in Poland, in Bulgaria, in uh, Austria, here and in the United Kingdom. And it all started, of course, in 2016 uh, with the first of the series of um, political shocks that the West uh, went through and continues to be going through till now. Started with Brexit, of course, Trump, Austrian elections, populists coming uh, close to power, com coming for the first time in parliament in some countries, coming uh, to power actually in coalitions in other countries. And of course, we all felt the urge to understand what's going on actually. But what we were very much interested in observing the responses, the first responses to this shock um, of us, the liberals, so to say, the liberal media, analysts, etc. And what we were observing that very often we were confronted with such narratives which talk about the supporters of populist movements in a kind of degradative way, um, with a sort of, um, um, in a way, arrogance, um, talking about that these people are, of course, uneducated, they're probably misled, they're all fake news around that actually made them vote for this and that. Um, very easily one was coming to calling them fascists or xenophobes, etc. And this made us, several of us in the Time to Talk network, feel a little bit uneasy with this because it's a sort of uh, presumes that we know all the answers, we are on the side of progress, and there are these other people that actually we have to teach. They're a little bit like school children or students who failed the exam, and now we have to give them another chance. Take the example of Brexit. There are lots of talks now, the referendum should be repeated. We should give them another chance to make the right um, <laughs> choice. So um, there were so many of us supporters of democracy kind of um, in the one sentence saying we are very much for the democratic procedures and for democracy, but these people should not be led to 
enter power, although they come for second or whatever. Um, we should not take their decision seriously, like Brexit, for example. So there was, this was the start of our um, idea of doing these debates. Uh, we thought that it is really um, important to do something because we were seeing this sort of partisan polarization on both sides, on our side and on the side of those who go for populist um, ideas. Yes. And we saw this partisan polarization as unproductive and misleading. Unproductive because it stigmatizes a whole lot, uh, a big portion of the, of the voters, and in a way defines them their right of um, making up their minds. Um, as a result, they grow. On the next elections, there are more people who are supporting these ideas. And it is also misleading because somewhere behind, there is the presumption there that um, everything that the traditional parties did so far was right, it was correct, it was the good, it was about progress, it was about globalization, it's all good. And uh, actually, wha who are these people? And we thought, actually, there might be some wrong things in how uh, the political uh, life was, politics was going in Europe and in the West in general. So this is why we decided to try and open these channels of communication between the two sides of this partisan polarization uh, split. And we were aware that it will be very difficult. It's very difficult to open this, these channels. Very often, if some of you have witnessed other debates, etc., there are people talking about this um, opinion bubbles where we are and we cannot reach and oh, how bad this is, but never you invite the other side. Uh, and actually, it turned out to be even more difficult than we thought because many of the platforms actually which are open-minded, it seems presumably um, progressive, etc., they are not willing actually to invite people from the other side. They are not willing to engage um, in these conversations. This is how we thought of a format, how to make you listen to the other side, how to bridge this gap. We thought of identifying people who have made this ideological trajectory from liberal to populist. So for example, because, why we did that? Because we thought that when you share part of the biography, of uh, the, the ideology with someone, that the ideology that someone had, then you probably will open your ears and mind better to listen why they became populist. Uh, so this was our way to try and understand um, the, the, the populist turn. And um, for example, we had Gisela Stewart, who is a Labour MP in Britain and who was, uh, for example, sent by Tony Blair to work on the European Constitution. And then she became the leader of the Vote Leave campaign. She's an activist of Brexit. Um, um, very interesting. <laughs> we had people like um, D David Goodhart, who in his book makes somehow suggests that there is a split which globalization brings with itself. People from somewhere, he calls it, and people from anywhere. The people from anywhere are people that are highly educated, they're experts, they can grow in any circle, they, you can plant them in another city, another context, they'll find their way, they'll have jobs, they're convertible, they speak languages. They're basically the winners of globalization. And they're the people from somewhere who are rooted, who never traveled or very much moved in their life. They traveled until 20 kilometers per parameter. And they are actually the losers of globalization. So whatever, what is the progress for the ones is the backlash or the problem for the other. For us, this was a very interesting framework of understanding actually what's going on. Um, here now, we're going somehow, the Bali decided that there is a need to bridge another gap and talk about actually the divisions between East and West. And what does populism, what are the roots of populism in the East and what are the roots of populism in the West? Um, so this will be more, as you said, on the topic here, but tonight at seven o'clock, the debate we will have is more in this X format and the one on the 19th of, of June, there will be another one, the third and final here in Amsterdam, also in this um, framework. So thank you and I wish you a very good discussion. Thank you.
I'll, I'll, uh, if, if I can ask you to come, come back on stage just for one question. Sorry. I have one more question for you back on stage, which, because I think it's good um, to define what populism is, just briefly, and I guess I'll, I'll, we'll get to that with the other speakers as well, because um, we can say Trump is a populist, but maybe Hillary Clinton was one just as well. Maybe Barack Obama was one, maybe Angela Merkel is one. What, what is your definition of a populist? Very important question, and uh, this is something that Jan Werner Müller will not agree with me, but I personally, Good. <laughs> I personally think that this is a very unuseful term, actually. I think it's a term which is a veil, which doesn't help us actually understand what's going on, and that we put in it usually those political movements that we don't like. For example, if you're a leftist, probably Syriza will not be populist for you, or Podemos, um, so... Um, Do you I have an alternative, would, a better would, term? No, because I don't think it's one term. I think there are many um, uh, phenomena which we put under this umbrella term. Okay. So I think it needs more specific... Maybe we'll hear more <laughs> specific definitions. Thank you so much. We'll work on a better term, but in the meantime, <laughs> today we'll keep using this term because it's uh, so convenient as an umbrella term but point taken. Um, uh, our next speaker asked me not to uh, go through his entire list of education uh, and, and career movements, so I won't. Uh, he was already mentioned, Jan Werner Müller, one of the most important voices on populism in Europe uh, and the US. Uh, he teaches at Princeton University right now in New Jersey. Uh, he's the author of the book, What is Populism? So he's the one uh, to know. Please welcome Jan Werner Müller. Thank you very much. What I'll try to do is answer three questions. What is populism? I'll one more time try to convince Desi. Second, what do populists do when they get to power? And thirdly, what causes populism? All in 15 minutes or less. At least it's more than 140 or 240 characters. So what is populism to begin with? Is this a useful term at all? Well, certainly, the conventional wisdom of our time is that anybody who, as the cliched phrase then goes, criticizes elites or acts up against the establishment is automatically deemed a somehow dangerous populist. When you think about this, it's actually a very strange thought. Up until recently, any old civics textbook would have told you that keeping an eye on the powerful is actually a sign of good democratic engagement and should not automatically make you into some kind of peril for democracy. But all of a sudden, at the beginning of the 21st century, we read and hear virtually every day that populists are those who criticize the elites and therefore somehow might be undermining our liberal democracies. Now, it's true that when populist politicians are in opposition, they criticize sitting governments. And in that sense, yes, are critical of elites. But above all, I believe they always also do something else. They always claim, in one way or another, that they, and only they, represent what populists typically call the real people, or also the silent majority. Now, at first sight, that might not sound so bad. That's not obviously the same as racism. That's not obviously the same as, let's say, a fanatical hatred of the European Union. And yet, and yet, I believe it always does have two pernicious consequences for democracy. First of all, populists are also go then going to claim that all other contenders for power are fundamentally illegitimate. And this is never just a disagreement about policy or even about values which, after all, is completely normal and ideally even productive in a democracy. No, the populists always immediately make it moral and personal. The problem is always that the others are simply corrupt, or to coin a phrase, crooked characters. Secondly, and maybe less obviously, populists are also going to claim that all those among the people themselves, all those citizens who do not share their ultimately symbolic construction 
of the supposedly real people, that with all those citizens, you can basically put their membership in the people in question. Remember, for instance, just to give a brief illustration, Brexit has been mentioned by Desi in the introduction. Remember Nigel Farage's speech at the end of that night when he said that the vote had been, as he put it, a victory for real people, implying, of course, that the 48% of British people who wanted to stay inside the EU, well, on some level, aren't quite real. Or, an example from the country I happen to live in, if you don't clap for Donald Trump's State of the Union address, what is he going to call you? Un-American. It's this tendency. It's this tendency to reduce political questions to forms of culture war, to forms of exclusionary identity politics that I would say is crucial to grasp about populism. So it's not anti-elitism. Any of us here can criticize elites. Doesn't mean we are right, but that's not what matters, and that's certainly not what is automatically dangerous for democracy. What is dangerous for democracy, and what I would say is crucial with populism, is anti-pluralism. It's the tendency always to exclude others at the level of party politics, but even more worryingly, at the level of the people themselves, citizens, where, if in doubt, already vulnerable minorities are going to get it from populists. Briefly, on to the second question. Can they actually govern? I think this is important to put on the table for our discussion because there remains a very widespread view, also very prominent again this past week in the run-up to you know, the outcome in Italy, a very widespread view among liberals in the widest sense that virtually by definition populists cannot really govern because we are often told they are all protest movements. By definition, once you get into power, you cannot protest against yourself or variation of this idea, they're all anti-elitist. Once you are in government, you've become the elite, so you can continue your anti-elitist discourse. Or, slightly related but different claim, all these populists have such unbelievably simplistic policy ideas that on day two of their administration, it's going to become blindingly obvious to everybody that nothing really works in practice. No walls are being built, no trade agreements are being renegotiated. It's going to be completely clear to everybody that nothing really is unfolding as they promised. I think these are all very naive, in a certain sense, very complacent views. We have plenty of examples in our era, some of them have been mentioned in the introduction, to prove to us that yes, populists can actually govern, and more importantly, they can specifically govern as populists, which, if you find my proposition at all plausible, means they can really govern as anti-pluralist, which really means they're not ultimately going to recognize the legitimacy of an opposition, and then more particularly the legitimacy of independent actors such as free media, judges, and so on. We've seen this time and time again in countries you all know it, like Turkey, like Hungary, like Poland, Venezuela, this is not a left-right issue, possibly India in our day, and possibly at least at the level of presidential rhetoric, the United States as well. If you like, later on we can also talk about what I think has even emerged as a particular, as perverse as the term might sound, populist art of governance, which has a further set of specific features which are not quite, I think, as obvious as the denial of legitimacy to any of uh, the institutions or actors who disagree. But I leave that for now, and swiftly, since this was part of our brief, this is what we were supposed to put on the table for you this afternoon, briefly engage with the whole question of what the hell is causing all this? Why is all this, why is all this happening? Well, two preliminary thoughts on this, if I may. The other, of course, absolutely conventional wisdom of our day the one image that one absolutely cannot avoid, it seems, when talking about populism in our day, is the image of the wave. Or as Nigel, uh, as Nigel Farage, for whom apparently the wave was too petty an image, put it, the tsunami of populism, which, you know, to stick with the metaphor, was going to wash away the establishments and the elites everywhere. I believe that this image is deeply misleading. 
it suggests something like an irresistible trend, when in fact there is no irresistible trend. When people then, to kind of explain this image of the wave, go on to say, well, look, first there was Brexit, and then there was Trump, and then look at all these other actors who came very close to, uh, to, to actually winning elections. I think what they tend to forget is that neither Brexit nor Trump nor some of the further developments can really count as, so to speak, freestanding triumphs of, in this case, right-wing populists. No. Brexit didn't happen because of Nigel Farage. Brexit happened because of very established conservative politicians. Donald Trump, to remind you of the obvious, was not the candidate of a grassroots right-wing populist movement of, as the cliche then has it, the white working class. No, he was the candidate of a very established party. And as strange as it might sound, 2016 was a very normal election. More than 90% of self-identified Republicans voted for their party. And that, after all, is what people usually do. They came out for their party. The candidate, I grant, was maybe not very normal. But the point is that up until this day, up until this day, nowhere in Western Europe, nor in North America, has a right-wing populist party come to power without the collaboration of established conservative elites. Where these conservatives have withheld their support, think of the Austrian presidential election 2016, these right-wing actors have not succeeded. So I think we should not sort of keep repeating this point about the wave as if it were an empirical you know, fact that is so obvious and clear to everybody. We're actually talking the talk of the populace. We're talking the talk of Stephen Bannon, who, if you recall, on his recent, well, you can't quite say victory tour, but you know, his recent tour of Europe, of course, also said, look, it's a historical tide, and it's with us and not with them. It's not that obvious. Secondly, though, I think it's also important to resist what for some people has become the sort of alternative narrative, one that became, I think, particularly attractive on March 16th, 2017, the day after elections in this country, when all of a sudden newspapers were full of stories that said, ah, Wilders didn't win. So now we're in the post-populist moment already. The tide is receding. No. You know all this much better than I do, but at least my view of the matter is that, yes, somebody who, from my perspective, clearly is a populist, didn't win. Although I have no idea what it would have meant in a PR system for him to win anyway, but never mind. Um, but if we have an outcome where, yes, the official populist doesn't win, but then, with all due respect, our supposedly mainstream, responsible, even pro-European, in the widest sense, liberal prime minister, puts ads in newspapers where he says, act normal or leave the country, I think the picture isn't quite so clear in terms of what won and what lost exactly. So uh, if nothing else, my plea to you is to get away from this tendency, which I see very strongly in our day, that with every election, certainly in Europe, but maybe even globally by now, all we ever ask is, is populism up or is populism down? No, it's much more complex, it's much more multidimensional, but of course that's what every professor always says at the end of all remarks. <laughs> so, to counter that cliché, here's one more thought, which also gets to what we were officially meant to also talk about, which is East-West differences. As you know, many books have now been published about the supposed crisis of democracy. Many books are rolling off the presses literally every week, saying, look, these are the policy challenges which explain the rise of populism. And all these policy challenges, which are usually then mentioned, let's say rising inequality, let's say immigration, you all know what they are, they are real. I'm in no way disputing that. But a lot of these accounts don't quite give us the link from these particular challenges to populism. Because a lot of these challenges didn't just start the day before yesterday. And a lot of these challenges happen to be real in many countries but not in every country that has these challenges do we see populism as an outcome. So what I think we need to more specifically look for is somehow the question how, in a sense, populist actors convince citizens that the best account, the best explanation for their problems and for their politics and what's really going on is to tell people that there's a homogeneous, corrupt elite out there 
that is basically working against a virtuous people. If that image isn't there, we might be talking about lots of dangerous things. But at least from my perspective, we're not talking about populism. So how does it become more plausible to conjure up this image? Well, I think one thing that helps, it doesn't determine it, but one thing that helps is, I think, if you already have a culture war going on in your country. Populists will then usually come in and say, we are here to unify the people. Of course, de facto, they do the opposite. Their business model is constantly dividing people. But it kind of helps them if they have something to work with. So against that background, I think it is important to notice that according to some of the empirical studies of our colleagues, it's true that, for instance, in Eastern and Central Europe, cultural issues are very polarizing. Economic issues are much less politicized. In Southern Europe, by contrast, it's much more political and economic issues, not surprisingly, maybe, because of the, of the, of the Euro crisis. So in that sense, yes, there is more material to work with. But I would emphasize that this is a very different point than the one that at least I nowadays very often read in op-ed pieces, where people, especially from Western Europe, very casually tend to say, oh, well, these Eastern Europeans, you know, they only had a few years to get used to democracy. And you know what? They probably were always a little bit more illiberal anyway than we are in the enlightened, in the enlightened West. So no wonder that they have to live with the Orbans and the Kaczynskis and that they're basically a little bit behind. Yes, there are differences in both the cultural, but I think this explanation certainly doesn't work, and it partly doesn't work, very last point, I promise, is that is, is because we nowadays very often tend to read certain outcomes back into collective choices. What do I mean? We nowadays sometimes talk and act as if, in the case of Hungary in 2010, in the case of Poland in 2015, in the crucial elections, these populists had actually gone out there and said, hey, vote for me. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to abolish the rule of law. It's going to be great. Nobody had talked like this, okay? On the contrary, the relevant parties had all gone out of their way to present themselves as basically moderate conservatives. In the case of Kaczynski, where this was a little bit more difficult, you know, they went out of their way to, of course, put somebody else up for prime minister and make a point of saying, look, we just want to do nice things for families. If you have lots of kids, we're going to give you more money. But don't worry, nothing crazy is going to happen. In the case of Orban, also no talk of we're going to have a new national system, new constitution, and so on. People, in a sense, did what standard democratic theory would tell them to do, which is in a two-party system, if one party hasn't been doing well, has been discredited because of corruption, as in Hungary, or is seen as too complacent, as in Poland with Platforma, they just give the other guys a chance. So to now come from the outside and say, ah, you brought this on yourselves because you are so illiberal, I think is deeply deeply unjust. And the more we talk like this, and the more we kind of keep basically echoing this kind of image back to, back to Central and Eastern Europe, of course, the more the Orbans and Kaczynskis are going to say, yes, we are illiberals, and we are proud of it. And actually, you know, you're confirming exactly how we want to be seen as different. So I think it's a profound mistake to basically deepen that potential split with all too casual interpretations of what is happening. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Jan Werner Muller. That was excellent. Uh, for our next speaker, our next keynote is Ulrike Gerot. She's a philosopher and historian, has worked as a uh, political advisor for many years in Bonn and Brussels. She taught in Washington and is now back in Berlin, I believe, where she had the European Democracy Lab dedicated to the future of European uh, democracy. She'll be here for our next and second keynote. Please give her a warm welcome as well. Um, very pleased to, hear, to be here. Um, thank you for having picked a photo from 2011, which is uh, <laughs> quite nice. Um, I guess we are in a very sort of liberal elite setting because Slavomir, uh, Jan Werner and I, we are basically every two weeks on a panel discussing populism and um, very rarely I discuss with Alice Weigel or um, Karl-Heinz Strache. So um, perhaps that is what Bessie is about. 
Um, and so good luck for the project. I, uh, basically, everything has been said by Jan Werner Müller, so um, I'm just pleased to make perhaps additional remarks which um, make a different sort of shadow on, on the things. First, obviously, uh, I think we have a um, misperception of what populism is, because if you go back to the literature, populism as a de definition is a pretty good thing. I would bet that if you go to people like Willy Brandt or Kreisky, they would be very happy to be populist in the sense of close to the people. If you go to French literature, les classes populaires, the leaders of the 18th, 19th century, the socialist leader, were always very proud, like Jean Jaurès and others, to be the leaders of the populists, which is close to the citizens and close to the people. So if we are basically now perverting this word as the others, then I think indeed there is perhaps a liberal democratic class who has a problem, and we should think about the definition of what is a populist, because if populism is to be close to the people, then it's, it's precisely what you should do if you govern well. The problem is more probably, and I will talk a little bit of, about the EU, is that we didn't govern well. I mean, there is a lot of legitimized critique in the system of the European Union, and we, us, the liberal elites, were voiceless, not voicing this critique, and so we are leaving this critique. We left that critique to the populists. And I think the problem here is that they say the things that we didn't dare to say, um, to be very under complex, but what Habermas is saying in academic writings and where he gets awards for is basically what Bernd Lucke from AfD said about the euro. But when Bernd Lucke said this in the political arena in Germany, he was a populist, and when Habermas wrote this in an article, he would get an academic reward. So there is a problem in what we dare to say. And if we leave the critics, and I think Jan Werner made the point very clearly, critiques, I mean, every politics is about critical thinking and about critiques, so anti-establishment is fairly uh, okay. It's just like if there's no more critique in the system, then you leave the critique to the anti-system voices, and that is what happened within the EU at best, I think I can say. I can say this for Germany, to just lay a little point on, 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 on Germany, I am German, but um, it has been forgotten that the AfD is not Björn Höcke and this sort of anti-migration blah blah blah, but the Björn Höcke, the, the AfD, in its beginning was a party founded in April 2012 in the midst of the Euro crisis by people who were journalists at the FAZ, our most uh, noble uh, national newspaper, by uh, the president of our employers association um, and by uh, a professor of economics, huh? Bernd Lucke himself. So this is the establishment that Jan Werner Müller was talking about when he says there's no party that comes up in a populist sort of turn if it has not been supported and widely supported intellectually but also money-wise by conservative establishment. If you, I, perhaps you're not aware, but there are parts of the FDP because the FDP, our liberal party, had a uh, what we call Urabstimmung, a party consultation about the bailout packages in Greece because the party didn't want these. And those who didn't win this Urabstimmung went basically straight to the AfD. So the least you can say is that the AfD is a product of the basic bourgeois German establishment and not the product of German modernization losers or some neo-Nazis we always had neo-Nazis in the country. They were always down to 3%. We never cared for them that much. We always had modernization losers in the former East with, you know, bringing up GDR and so on and so forth. But what made the AfD at some point in history was that the establishment decided that we need an anti-Euro party. And then the AfD started walking on one leg. It had one leg, so on one leg you cannot walk. Yeah? So it was more or less hopping. And then later, three years, the AfD found out that you walk on two legs if you add to an anti-euro argument an anti-migration argument. And that was the time of 2015, three years later, and so the party could walk, and so the anti-migration argument hijacked the anti-euro argument, and here we are with a party that makes 16% in Germany, and everybody is puzzled how that could be. Just to make that very strong point, the problem if you look at populism in a European perspective, say north, south, east, west, a little bit east, west because the east is not in the euro, but let's stay on the north, south, the debitors and the creditors countries, say the Dutch and the German and the Finnish and the bubble countries, yeah, uh, Austria in, which are sort of, let's call it the broader Germany for a second. Uh, and the <laughs> <laughs> You heard the irony. Um, the Dutch were quite nicely hiding behind the German politics in the Euro crisis here. Huh? So, so. 
Um, but uh, if we stay there for a moment, the problem which is happening today is that the, 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 um, the populists we see emerging or we saw emerging in Europe are basically crossed, which is that through the Euro crisis on the years 10, 11, 12 and so on and so forth with the austerity policy, we saw the austerity populism more or less a lefty pr uh, a populism in the southern countries and Marine Le Pen, a little bit extra, but Marine Le Pen had a sort of social policy, yeah? so she was claiming social policy. So what I said is the system didn't allow critique, so the critique against the Euro policy of mainly Germany floated populist parties in the southern countries and very strongly in France. Marine Le Pen has, when she wiped out the father in 2011 and then took the party, she had 15 percentage points gains between 2011 and 2015. And these were the years in which austerity policy hit most and hit most France because France alone lost 500 million industry jobs in 2012 and in 2013. That's a million loss of industry jobs in two years that hits a country. And those who took advantage of it was Marine Le Pen, who was yelling against the system. That's a system that destroys you. I am La République. Huh? She basically presented herself as the salvation of La République Française. And if you want to read more about this, you read the brilliant book of Didier Eribon, who wrote Le Retour à Reims, who basically he describes the les classes populaires, les classes populaires, when the the Parti Socialist did no longer take care of it. Yeah, They fleed into the Front National because if ever you don't get social uprise, which is you know some pride of social status, you need the social pride, you need the pride through the nation. So where the social pride is lost, you got the national pride. So from Parti Communiste or Parti Socialiste, they went straight in the arms of Marine Le Pen. The problem today is that the say Dutch, Gerd Wilders, German, Finnish, true Finns, northern um, populism is totally at the crosses of what the southern uh, populism is, which is the re in reaction to the austerity populism, which claims for a different Eurozone governance, more spending and so on and so forth, you have the German discourse of we are the victims of everything because we do not want to pay, we do not want to share, and that is basically also the Gerd Wilder argument and others. And what, I, what I'm very strong pointing to is that we can only understand the way that the European populism fly in its totality so that we have more or less every country now affected when we understand that first we had the euro problem, then we had the migration problem. And both are intrinsically linked. First, you build up basically the austerity losses in the south, but every move now, see the Italian government, when the Italian government now comes and an Italian minister cannot be put into place because he said uh, silly things like uh, the Germans are winning World War I, they only do it with the economy and therefore the Italian minister cannot get his job, which is what the EU Commission then said, so he's not put into position. The problem is there's this Körnchen of Wahrheit, like we say in German, there's this you know, little, little point of truth, but it cannot be voiced and so the minister is out. But in reaction to what is happening, in Italy, the German newspapers are full of Italy is now costing us a lot. So what I'm trying to explain to you is that this cross situation of the two populism basically makes Europe completely ungovernmental, uh, un, uh, um, un, ungovernmental because every government needs to fail. Every move that the German government will do in favor of a sort of smoother Euro politics will immediately rise the populist movement in Germany and every um, movement that the Italians or the French will do to have more and more transfer union like the Germans say will obviously, uh, to, to basically deserve the Italian public, will will fuel the populism in Germany. And I think this is really doomed to fail because what we see is the failure of basically democratic governance in all EU member countries. If you look around for the two years, what we have been seeing is that basically none of the European countries is able to form a government. We had no government in Belgium for 10 months. We had no government in uh, Spain for eight months. We had no government even in Germany for four months. We are we were hopefully having no more new elections in Italy, but we were close to having new elections. Uh, and we have in France basically this ni droite ni gauche, which is that throughout the European Union, the populist turn makes that we are shifting from a right-left dichotomy to a Europe versus um, sovereignist sort of dichotomy. And we call then the sovereignist populist, instead of perhaps realizing that there's a fair point that we definitely need to reform the EU and to make it more democratic. So, um, 
I think there are a couple p uh, of points which uh, I want to add to, to, to this to just for food of thought. But there is this very interesting Walter Benjamin quote, which is that before fascist sort of movements take place, there's always a failed revolution. And if you look at what is happening in terms of economic policies, you can make the point that we could have the policies that Trump or others, you know, basically do more for the people, uh, help the industries here, a little bit less trade. I mean, I'm not saying that globalization is the problem, but redistribution after globalization is the problem it from precisely the lack of distribution of the earnings of globalization is the problem. So globalization is fine, but as long as you make a distribution of the earnings of, this of globalization. If you don't do this, you have a split between the rural and the uh, more urban sites in Europe. By the way, the whole sort of socioeconomic fabrics in Europe is not that there is a wealthy, sparkling German and lazy Greeks, but what is really happening is that we have flourishing towns and regions like Paris has an unemployment of 4%, but France has 10%. So it's rural, urban, center, periphery, has not to do with uh, borders. Look at Austria, for instance. Vienna is totally fine. The rest of uh, Austria is not so fine. Look at Brandenburg, which is not really export champion, yeah, but uh, is uh, flying in the German um, uh, sort of uh, story. But the point here is that uh, we couldn't work out basically democratic and social terms in the framework of the European Union. And this is why we couldn't get the policies that protects our citizens through the progressive store and now we get it in some way to the populist door, which is that whatever you say, but some of the policies proposals, even if you look at Poland, Slavomir knows that better, but Kaczynski is doing nice social policies, nice social policies for women who get children to birth. I mean, you cannot really blame these people or these populists for doing social policies for people. It's just like the problem is, our problem is, that this comes together now with racism, xenophobia, and misogynism. I will be ending up here because we have time for discussion. Let me do, because I'm the only woman on the panel, a little feminist sort of note. But obviously the feminist sort of spin here is that nationalism always comes with the hidden argument that we need to get the women under control. Yeah? There is a latency of that argument, which you see very clearly in uh, birth programs like in Poland, you know, very much money for giving birth to, to you know, pulling off the women of the labor market, uh, in all these abortion fights, which you saw all over the place, that even if people, Jens, Peter Sp Jens Spahn in Germany, you know, one of the CDU person is making up the abortion discussion we had in the 1970s. So nationalism and anti-feminism are always sneaking through the same door. And I think there is a gender fight underneath this sort of nationalist populist fight. And I just wanted to be us aware of this. Thank you very much. <laughs> you. Are you suggesting Donald Trump is not a feminist? Because it sounded like that. Uh, we'll get to him later, I'm sure. Um, for our last uh, keynote, and then everybody will, will join on stage, uh, Slavomir Sirakowski. He's the head of Kritika Polityczna, and that's all the Polish I have in me. Um, a movement of intellectuals, artists, and activists based in Poland. He's also the director of the Institute for Advanced Study in Warsaw, and he's a contributor to uh, the New York Times and several other publications uh, throughout the world. Please a warm welcome uh, for Slavomir Sierakovsky for the last keynote. Uh, but, uh, I'm not an academic professor, so I'm going to sit. Uh, in the Institute of Advanced Study, you don't need to teach, which is very good. Um, if Had I been one, I would suggest to uh, rename the department in European, in European integration to be a department in European disintegration today because this is what you have. I will also answer three questions, but let me have first two remarks to disagree with Ulrike and uh, because we really uh, are very often in the same panel, so it's harder and harder to disagree, but <laughs> in, in two things I disagree. Maybe first with um, Ulrike, and we really have it. Pulsar is a very good falsification of this uh, um, overwhelming and the most probably popular uh, association with, uh, with populists. And uh, the, the, the main explanation why they are so successful 
this, uh, this explanation that it's about the no liberal consequence that people, a like, large amount of people be became excluded. Now they're angry, so they are uh, expressing their anger, voting for populists. Uh, Poland had the best economic results, the civic platform had the best economic results in entire Europe. Um, Polish accumulated growth was almost 25% in the time of civic platform. The, the, the unemployment went from 16% to, to 8%, now it's even, um, even smaller. Uh, the deficit from 8 to 3, Poland was the only country without recession in Europe. And civic platform lost totally uh, both presidential election to nobody actually, no one knew who is President Duda. Um, and, uh, and, to, and the parliamentary election as well. Uh, so what is really interesting now is that uh, populists are, can do well also in the times of economic, uh, uh, not it, populism are not connected uh, to, to populist uh, uh, recession. They are doing very well also in the time of uh, economic uh, hossa. This is what you have now. Look at, and I agree here with Jan Werner Miller that, uh, that populism, I would call it some, some kind of political disease. It's, it's a contagious. This is why the, the, the example with Wilders, I also, also use it. Um, he, he's tried to stole, to, to steal the language of uh, Mark Rutte, tried to stole the, steal the language of, of, of Gerd Wilders. This is how, how he won. This is now the same project. Now the same idea has Horst Zehofer uh, in Germany, and Bayern is not the the um, the eco it's not economic. It's actually the richest land of uh, of Germany, and 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 he's probably the biggest populist in mainstream party, uh, and he's tried he tries to steal the the votes from from AfD. Uh, so this is uh, this is what I think as for as for as for Jan Werner Miller. Of course, um, Kaczynski or, or Orban, uh, when, when, when they first uh, 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 run for um, uh, in, in parliamentary election, they didn't announce that we're going to paralyze the constitutional court, we're going to um, take over public media and turn it to the governmental propaganda, etc. No. But when they started to do, people were not like um, angry and angry on it. They wanted more and more, at least in Poland. And then, uh, as I remember, Fidesz was uh, re-elected after showing this uh, Ill Ill totally illiberal policy. So it's not that, the, that they surprised uh, um, voters or they, they, they or something was hidden. Nothing was hidden. Uh, Actually, the, 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 <coughs> the, the, the best example falsifying this, this, this conviction is that uh, openly Viktor Orban announced two March 2014 that he, finish, that he finished with liberal democracy. He announced the project of illiberal democracy. He did it openly. And then both leaders, uh, Kaczynski and, 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 and Orban, they announced illiberal counter-revolution in Europe, saying that we are relying on 100 million people joining us. So they, you, you cannot, like, it's, it's totally wrong to say that uh, people didn't vote, uh, that, that populism, it's not about illiberalism. I'll try to answer, and actually this is my answer, that po the populism is, is really, of course, it's not easy to define anything. Uh, you can always say that there are many different phenomena because there are many different countries, etc., etc. It's the easy answer. <clears throat> but uh, the, the common thing, and of course, it's that they usually they say that we are the nation, the, the, the people are, the, the other side is the enemy of the nation. But this is actually exactly the illiberal construction of political scene, where you don't have opponents, you have adversaries. Uh, it's out, this, 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 this conflict is possible only outside liberal democracy. Um, and because the anti-establishment anti party is fighting with entire project of illiberal democracy. It's not left and right. It's against both left and right uh, together. Um, and this is why um, populists are 
dangerous because they doesn't promise you that they gonna respect uh, the other side. Uh, they want to destroy the other side. This is illiberal. This is not. Uh, this is exactly the 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 the, 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 the definition of um, uh, of liberalism. Um, okay, I, I try to tell you three things. First of all, that um, Eastern Europe is even more disintegrated than Western Europe. It's not e really easy to define it in any sense. Like uh, it's very hard to find uh, other common features than geographic. Um, I'll, I'll give you one example. Uh, even taking those, th these two, 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 like even taking Poland and Hungary, look how different countries they are. Also, how different uh, populists are Orban and uh, and Kaczynski. Uh, I, the, the simple way to this to explain w what are the two politicians, what what is defining them, is that. Um, I would call Orban a cynic and Kaczynski a fanatic. I think it explains pretty well wh what is the uh, wh how they rule. Uh, it's like kind of a it, it's like a difference between mafia and cloister. This is why Fidesz created oligarchy uh, uh, around the family and friends of Orban. Uh, something similar to to what you have in Russia. Kaczynski completely the opposite. Kaczynski doesn't have a family, doesn't have a friends. Uh, doesn't have a bank account, doesn't have a driving license, doesn't have, like, really when, they, when he was asked, like, okay, what do you do at home? He says, I have a cat, and sometimes in the night I watch the Spanish rodeo on TV. <laughs> really, like, he's, uh, he also never really enters the, very rarely enters the scene. He always, he's a master of puppets. You can change the prime minister, but you cannot, so you can change a puppet, but the master of puppets is the same. And he, this is, and, and, and being so strange, he's also unelectable in Poland. This is why you have Manji Duda, nobody, and, uh, uh, and Lata Szydło or, or, or Mateusz Morecki, again, nobodies. He, there are like avatars that he is like changing, but he makes decisions. The, the, the most basic personal decisions even. He's a kind of a control freak because this is exactly what defines populists. Uh, they hate independent uh, institutions. This is why um, they are fighting with... This is actually... Look at how, how different traditions th these are because they are not fighting with democracy. They are fighting with liberalism. And both are v very different. They merged at some point in history, but they are two, two different things. Demo democracy, it's, it's, it's not really the, the thing that they are against on, uh, on, because also they are defining themselves and they are fighting uh, with the other side using the definition of democracy. It's just a different definition. They're saying, you don't want us to reform the judiciary. You want, us, uh, you, you want to stop our reform of public media, NGOs, etc. You fight. We are democracy elected, so you're fighting with uh, with democracy. Okay, it, you can call it the sovereign-oriented democracy. Liberal democracy is not uh, only about who rules and and, and the, the 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 government can the, the democratically elected government rules. It's also about the separation of power, independent uh, judiciary independent a civil society, which again, it's a liberal, it's a part of liberal tradition, etc. So they are, they are predominantly fighting with, uh, with liberalism. Of course, you can, you can ask a question and it's going to be totally legitimate and very, very reasonable question. Can democracy survive without this liberal component? And of course, I don't believe it. It's short term, it's maybe possible long term, not really. This is actually why I I'm sorry, I think, that Hungary is lost. Poland not, not at all. Um, and uh, and um, look, also what's the very important difference between Hungary and Poland? Tr I try still to answer the question of how different the countries are. Usually they are juxtaposed together. Um, Fidesz is in the center. Uh, uh, the different, okay, first of all, the difference between cynic and fanatic is that cynic always at the end is pragmatic. Uh, cynic thinks about the consequences. Th cynic never commits suicide. Um, 
Whereas fanatic don't care about consequences uh, or, or anything. He can commit suicide, take in Poland with himself. This is what Kaczynski did in his career a few times. He commits suicide in uh, 1991 when he totally, without any reason, just lost power. 2005, 2007 as well, he attacked for a like, conspiracy theory reason his main coalitioner. And again, he announced he a snap election, he lost it. Uh, this is why the main enemy of Kaczynski is still Kaczynski himself. The, I actually had the same, uh, the same thing when, it, when Tusk was supposed to be re-elected. Kaczynski knew that everybody will uh, vote for Tusk, even, even Orban did, uh, which is symptomatic and confirms what I'm talking about. And still Kaczynski uh, wanted to do it, and he lost totally. Um, so, um, so, so, and also this, this, the fact that Fidesz is in the center and has always uh, Jobbik on the side, so he can easily blame uh, blackmail Brussels. He can say, and he can come and say, you don't like me, you wanna fight with me, you're gonna get Jobbik tomorrow, okay? Kaczynski is not. The good thing, the only good thing about Kaczynski is that he keeps entire right and center right part of the political scene, so we don't have any like m more radical right wing party. Um, and uh, and also Kaczynski is not a part of EPP. He's a part of some kind of crazy um, small faction in Europe with Tories who, that are anti so eurosceptic that even not going to be in you anymore in your parliament. So and, and and Fidesz is. This is why. Uh, especially now when you're going to have huge losses in EPP and both Social Democrats, he, his vote, the, the Fidesz is needed in, in, in EPP. So again, he can really be pragmatic. He's a good uh, dancer on the red line. Uh, Kaczynski doesn't think about any red lines, doesn't care. Um, um, okay, the second thing would be um, to prove you that European, and it's again against what, uh, 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 it's my disagreement with Jan Werner Miller. Not that we are like Im immature and stupid and Western Europe is mature and stupid. It's not, it's not like this. Um, it's that uh, liberalism is just not really a Eastern European tradition. <laughs> and this is the simple fact. We don't have Polish John Locke. We don't have Polish uh, Thomas Hobbes or something. It's just, it's a Western uh, tradition. Of course, differently and rooted in different countries in the West. But look, Eastern, if you, if you will count in, ma in, in how many uh, countries populist rule in Eastern Europe, you see that in, out of 15 countries, I'm, I'm, I'm defining Eastern Europe, starting with, with Poland, ending in Macedonia, how uh, you, you have seven, they are, they are ruling in seven out of 15 countries in Eastern Europe, and they are two, two and they have, uh, they are in, in two more they are in coalition, and in three more they, they, are, main, they, 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 they are main opposition supported by more than 20% of, of voters. In Western Europe, I'm not talking about the Southern Europe, in Western Europe you don't have even one populist head of the state. They are in, in two countries in the government, but they are not in, the, in Switzerland and Austria. But, they are, but it's, it's like so really because we used to think that it's a general problem everywhere, like in the United States, in Turkey, in Poland, in France, etc. Different, it's that still we have different political regions with different political cultures. And I think liberalism plays a significant um, role <coughs> here. Also, because it's to implement democracy, it's quite easy. You implement s certain procedures, you write a constitution, you're done. To implement liberalism, it's a 200 years job or 100 years, it's a tradition, it's a way of thinking, it's a mentality, it's identity, it's really something different. So, um, so this is why, uh, why it really looks a little different. Also, 1989 uh, uh, has consequences, for example, that another difference is that in Eastern Europe, we don't have really left. 
the construction of political scene, and it, it, it has serious consequences. The construction of political scene after 1989 used to be, from the beginning, quite anti-liberal, because we used to have open society versus closed society. We used to have elites of transition that supported transition, and anybody, and like some, and people, so it was like not really left and right division, more right and wrong, okay? <laughs> and it doesn't give you liberal democratic choice, okay? That where you have two legitimate sides, like left and right, so one can lose but it's not illegitimate, illegitimate in, uh, it has still its place in liberal democracy. Whereas if you have open, who gonna vote for closed society? It's that both sides perceive uh, one, each other as illegitimate. This is what you still, this is, this is how it works um, um, in Eastern Europe. There, there are many, many more. Of course, you have still this Communist Party pattern. I think for Kaczynski, the only, mis the only bad thing about Communist Party is that it was not himself who was running it. <laughs> but uh, but the, the way how they behave, the way how they treat people inside, the way how is it constructed, this, this, this kind of uh, political liturgy and this liturgic discipline, how they behave inside is very similar. Um, of course, the difference is also in the perception of sovereignty. If you border with Atlantic Ocean, it's a different story if you border Russia, okay? Um, and if you regained your independence after being 250 years either a part of Russia or a satellite of Russia, then thinking that you, a part of your sovereignty will go to Brussels, it's a different calculation than, uh, than in other countries. I'm sorry, but this is, the, this is the, the reality. I'm not saying that we are doomed not to be... We have tradition of solidarity. We have huge uh, symbolic capital, uh, which is um, invested in civil society in Poland. This is why we have, we have huge tradition of resistance. You know, everything... F I mean, if fascism and communist, communism failed in Poland, then Kaczyzm will also fail. No worries. But it can take time, but... Uh, but I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm Okay, like to put it shortly, my definition, because I, I cannot just run away from this question, would be that the populism uh, is kind, isn't, first of all, an antinomy uh, of liberalism. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Can I ask you as well to join us? Thank you, Slavomir, uh, because you have the last... A word a bit before I start interjecting with my own questions. Maybe one of the two other panel members wants uh, to respond, Mr. Muller, to what you just heard. You can also say that I that I am right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would save a lot of time. <laughs> wouldn't you like that? And wouldn't then people again say, "Oh, these you know homogeneous liberal elites, you know, always the same, always agreeing with each other." I did this job stage. already, you know, to to show that we are not. Well, let me let me let me then try to. Why is he wrong? Continue the job. So here's my, in a nutshell, conceptual, if you like, disagreement. For me, illiberal democracy is not necessarily a contradiction in terms. So democracies can clearly produce illiberal policies. They might even sometimes have what we might call illiberal constitutions. For instance, if you have, you know, very reduced rights for religious minorities, let's say. It's perfectly fine to call that illiberal. But what you were also describing, actors who say the other side is not really legitimate. If the other party wins, it's not an acceptable outcome. And when then the same actors get to government and don't just produce generally illiberal policies, but actually start to damage or sometimes maybe even destroy the very rights which are essential for democracy. Free assembly, free speech, things like media pluralism. A liberal tradition. Of that is not just liberalism. <laughs> freedom Look, of speech, if you are, freedom of democracy life. is about cha potentially changing majorities. If democracy is only if my side wins, it's not democracy at all. So unless you want to say, maybe you want to say that, but unless you want to say, okay, it's a democracy as long as we have elections and the regime on the day is not literally stuffing the ballot boxes. If that is our expectation of democracy, then actually some of the countries you mentioned also already fail because if you recall, the most recent Hungarian election was called free but not fair. If that's our understanding, okay, it wouldn't be my understanding. And if basically governments touch these basic rights and make it 
extremely difficult, in some cases impossible to have a change of power, we should be clear and say it's not just illiberal, it's actually damaging democracy itself. I think it's conceptually and philosophically important, as highfalutin as that might sound, but also at the level of, if I may put it that way and that bluntly, strategy is important. Because if you just say, Orban is an illiberal Democrat, he's going to say, thank you very much. Exactly. That's how I want to be seen. Thank you for still leaving me with democracy. Because if you were to say, Hungary isn't a democracy anymore, that would be a problem for them. If you simply say, I'm not a liberal, okay. And at the level of the EU, I think it's also very important that the Commission sometimes presents itself as the kind of liberal repair crew. You know, Franz Timmermans comes in and says, okay, you have a problem with the rule of law. I come with my tools and my technocratic approach. We'll fix it, you know, a bit of adjustment here and there, and then we have the rule of law back. Instead of being much more open and saying, look, it's not just liberalism. It's not just the rule of law, it's democracy itself. And that way we also don't end up with this implicit division of labor, where the EU always does liberalism, and of course the nation state does democracy. Instead, the EU should say, look, we also have a mandate to basically help citizens who are losing the chance to ever get a different government to regain that chance. We're not choosing the winners, of course. We're not saying we're taking sides in a domestic conflict. But we also don't accept the argument that, oh, as long as, as, long as I'm popular, therefore I'm democratic. First, Ulrike, what's your response? I know you want to say something urgently, but <laughs> it's usually better when I just when would you like to introduce the notion of the republic into the game, because we know from Aristoteles that democracy is not the majority of the street. And I think we are in trouble because in the, let's say, past 20 years of political scientists, we um, used to understand democracy more as a formal procedure, which is elections. And as long as you win elections, you are a Democrat. And so Erdogan, Putin, Orban, everybody learned, I'm elected, I have a majority, I'm a Democrat. So the majority of the street, and that was your argument, can do very wrong things or things which are immoral. You know, I mean, I come from Germany, you could also me. If the majority of the street is the sort of a democracy, then the Nazis were probably the best democracy, Volksdemokratie, we ever had in Germany. Yeah, We do not want to pretend this. So I think we do have a problem with a formal conception of democracy, and that is where we are hijacked in, and that is why it is not for random that the constitutions we are constituted in are all republics, yeah? Respospolita, Repubblica d'Italiana, I know that's a critical argument in the Netherlands, but at least you are, yeah. But know that, be and now I come to Slavomir, Bundesrepublik Deutschland, Republika Italiana, but the, if Slavomir says that there's no liberal tradition in, in the East-West, and we would, weaker. Uh, in a weaker, and that there is a liberal tradition in the West, I would tell you that when John Locke translated the, in the Putney Papers in 1647, yeah, the Republican thinking into his writings, then the translation of uh, Republic was Commonwealth. We tend to understand that the Commonwealth is the British Empire, but the Commonwealth is res publica in the Latin sense of shared wealth, the organization of shared wealth. So what we know from research is that over the past 300 years, the deviation of what the so-called liberal thinkers meant to say, even Adam Smith, the individual, indivi uh, this invisible hand and so, the invisible hand is not the market and an algorithm who says demand offer, but the invisible hand is God is moral, is control of markets. So when today we say liberal thinkers, we need to understand that what they called liberal is at best what we understand today as social liberal thought or whatever Catholic Genossenschaftsdenken, whatever we have. So if you go back to Ludwig Erhard, if you go back to the Alena program of the CDU, I mean, these are not liberal th thoughts or Rhineian Westphalian capitalism. This is by any standards not the liberalism we talk about today. So first we should need to know what we say or what we want to talk about when we say democracy, and I would enter the word of republic, <coughs> but also I would dispute the thesis that there's a real difference in how we look at liberalism. I would rather make the argument that we have today a perverted idea of what the real liberal writers were about, and we have basically, uh, yeah, perverted them, and therefore create a divide between our own thinking, which was pretty much Republican thinking, which is that politics needs to care for the Republic, which is the common good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, there's one, one concept. Can I you want to respond to this? Yeah, yeah. Well, one one, one, <coughs> one uh, sentence, bec it's because if for young Werner Miller, freedom of speech 
as a part of the what of what defines democracy and not liberalism it really means that liberalism is so obvious to you that you even don't see it and you implement it a priori to the definition of democracy which exactly ex shows the difference between our political cultures you are from the political culture where liberalism is invisible because it's so well and rooted and connected to democracy. Freedom of speech doesn't tell you, doesn't answer the, democracy answers one question, who rules? Liberalism answers the question, how rules, okay? So democracy doesn't promise you happiness, it only promises a vote. Democracy oh. can commit suicides. Democracy can even be totalitarian mm -hmm. because totalitarianism, by the most common definition, is uh, that it controls all spheres of your life. Democratically elected power also can control all spheres of your life. So it's not a very useful phrase. No, it's useful, but this is why it's so fragile and we need to have this liberal component. And it's not by chance that we have it. And we should be very careful that and, and, and keep this, this joint venture. There's this, this concept getting, getting popular among some about the people versus democracy, basically stating that there's among people there's just less of an appetite for uh, democracy. People tend to care less and less about, I see two or three people nodding. Um, but, but that's the argument. People, people are maybe get a, a more authoritarian streak, and they just start to care about democracy less. Is that any uh, anything you um, well, subscribe to? Well, no. I mean, w uh, first of all, I think we have never been in a time in the past, say, decade, where so many discussions about democracy would take place in the first place, right? I mean, I mean, we are uh, discuss. That's, that's among people like you. That, yeah. No. Not no. No, it's not among us, because Björn Höcke is standing with Begida on the marketplace and he also claims democracy, you know. And then there is this split, say, we call ourselves a civil society and we want to save democracy, that's why we are all here, you know. But the thing is that Begida is also civil society, they just want a very different thing. But as unless we tell that they are military society, they are also civil society, yeah. So what we are only doing is that we place the Agora, which formerly was representative in the, in the Bundestag or in whichever parliament, now it's on the street or it's on the theater, and we are sitting here and we are discussing the defense of democracy and Pegida is standing in Dresden and they are also defending democracy because they want finally their will and uh, sort of there is some arrogance that we claim that we are saving it because we know it better and uh, you, you, that's what, what, what uh, Gessi said, yeah? And uh, I think uh, we should that take, uh, well, what we are really negotiating is basically that we are eroding representative democracy into, um, into participatory doc uh, uh, um, democracy, yeah? We can discuss whether that's good or bad, but uh, sort of this uh, old Rousseauian term, which is uh, la volonté de tous et la volonté générale, which is volonté générale, you find it in a parliament, and volonté de tous is, you know, you add on the, the people's vote, like direct democracy. Let's just say that this is not the first time in life that we have that historical upraise, you know. We had French Revolution, then came uh, Robespierre, we had uh, 1905 Revolution, then came the Bolsheviks, but then there came the Soviet councils, but it's not the first time that we try to find ways of direct democracy. Today we have the internet and we can do IP voting. Perhaps we are better off in reinventing a digital version of uh, direct democracy. But let's just say that in the history, all these uh, uh, you know, um, ideas to install in direct democracy failed. And there were always, at the end of the day, some animal farm procedures, which is some were better than <laughs> the others, right? So, and the, the new Italian. So I'm, I'm, I'm just saying mm. that uh, what we are really fighting through is this representative versus direct democracy thing, yeah? And uh, those who are now <coughs> in, in with this slogan of participatory democracy, which is if you go science like me, you want to get money from the EU Horizon 2020 projects, you just need to go uh, participatory democracy. They have not, su not such a field of research which is, you know, like participatory. So there is something that more people want to be active, but why? Last sentence, I think we all have that sentiment of a crisis, which is that we have, have erosion of our uh, habitual environment. 
And that's why people feel, let me say something, let them hear me, yeah? Because what is happening, and that is what we call a crisis, is in the sense of how Na Arendt, when she says the sense of politics, is the erosion of prejudgments. The moment you had a stable order, you know, I come from Germany, it was sort of the USSR is bad, the USA is good, NATO is good, Israel is good, uh, Arafat is bad, sort of, you know? Poland is good. Whatever, yeah? But it was more or less stable, right? And now all this is eroding. The US is no longer good. The US, the Russia may be better than we thought, you know? So everything is eroding. And so what we call a crisis is the renegotiation of the prejudgments of the society. Mm -hmm. And in that process, everybody wants to be heard. Hear me. I'm no longer believing in your knowledge order, which is NATO is good and you know, so on and so forth. We want to create a new knowledge order. Hear me, I have a different vision of reality. And I think that's what we call a crisis because we need to organize that process of refining collectively new prejudgments of society. You live um, uh, in Princeton, in, in the US, and there was a lot of talk over the past year that, that, that the uh, pillars of a democratic society would start to erode from the press to the judges to Congress. I, I, can, I think we can safely say they're, they're all still standing even though they have been tested. If you compare the state of democracy in, in the US right now, uh, if you compare that to what we've been talking about today in, in, in Europe, what's the... Um, how do, how do they compare and where do they not compare? I hope you'll forgive me if I one more time pick up <laughs> our quarrel <laughs> with just one word. Good. There was really a no reason for me to be here today. A, <laughs> <laughs> a fantastic uh, Polish-born social scientist once said, democracies are a system where parties lose, which is another way of saying where you can throw the bums out. The conditions of that, I still believe, are things like free assembly, free speech, a free press. Everything else you can sort of say, well, that's clearly liberal, and in that sense, yes, it can have an illiberal outcome when the, the majorities make certain, certain decisions. But if you abolish these basic rights, and then you really want to say it's still democracy, I really don't see the plausibility of that. And I don't think that our, our concepts are determined by the countries we are from, they should be determined by the strength of the arguments. But then what would be a good phrase? Because yeah, yeah, if you have a dicta dictatorship on one hand and, and a full democracy So the one on I the would other. use, I know this is not super sexy, um, but the one I would use is something like damaged democracies. Because it kind of at least implies that somebody purposefully did the damage. It's not so, you know, people talk about backsliding or erosion. Erosion is a kind of natural process, you know, it just sort of happened. And all the people that you were kind of alluding to who tend to now say, oh, people have less and less support for democracy. I think a lot of these empirical findings are highly dubious. It kind of opens the door again to very typical 19th century, basically prejudices from mass psychology. You know, the irrational masses. You know, they bring crazies to power. Uh, let's e ideally take even more decision-making power away from them and so on. Instead of actually saying, well, look, you know why? I mean, you mentioned this very clearly. Why is Orban there? Because he's supported by a supposedly mainstream, you know, pro-European, European People's Party. So it's not, it's not necessarily at the level of all the crazy masses. A lot has to do, and now I'm going to sound like a populist maybe, with certain elite decisions. And we have to hold these people accountable. Instead of being complacent liberals who say, oh, yeah, we always knew that. Give the people a chance. You know, they're going to do crazy, crazy things. If I may answer your question as well. I hope um, so. <laughs> so, yes, clearly all the cases that we also mentioned in our discussion are different. It would be wrong to homogenize all this and say, oh, Turkey is like the US, it's like Venezuela. Clearly there are differences. Um, and yes, in general, it's probably very plausible to say that in the US, the institutions have shown a significant degree of resilience. Sometimes in surprising ways. I mean, beyond the sort of obvious uh, matters of, let's say, judges, it's been very interesting to observe, for instance, how something that was very often coded for the American left as something very negative, federalism, states' rights, which were basically seen as sort of always complicit with the defense of racism, slavery, discrimination, and so on, all of a sudden is seen in a completely new light. Because as many of them have pointed out, Trump can kind of ignore the resistance on the streets. He can very often ignore Democrats in Congress. If California says we're not playing ball when it comes to the implementation of certain policies, he cannot ignore that. Now, that's not a lesson that travels easily, 
Many of the countries we've also talked about, Hungary, Poland, they don't have that level of decentralization. But at least for me, it's been an interesting lesson because you, you may recall that the German constitution has this paragraph where they say democracy and basic rights can never be abolished and federalism can never be abolished. And that was often treated in a kind of casual, flippant way, like plenty of countries that do not have federalism, decentralization, and they're perfectly good democracies. All of a sudden, there's an interesting lesson that actually, yes, under these conditions, decentralization can be incredibly important. And again, this doesn't easily travel maybe to many other contexts, but where relevant actors maybe have the chance, cities, local judges, maybe it's sort of important for them to take on board this idea that, okay, if we have any institutional kind of footholds for resisting the central government, and my understanding is that certainly in Hungary, things have become incredibly centralized from schools upwards. In Poland as well, they're trying to centralize. It's important to kind of use these institutional resources. One more point and then we'll go to audience questions. Go just ahead. Just one sentence to really underscore what Jan van Amela has said, because populism doesn't fall from the skies and it is basically a reaction to wrong policy choices of the elites and we would need to confess this. I mean, look at, uh, that's why I'm always bringing the Republic into the game, because it is basically, even in the Grundgesetz of the Bundesrepublik Deutschland, yeah, there is eine Gemeinwohlbindung uh, of every legislation process, which is that every le law of Germany should serve the public good. If you think that for, you know, for instance, in the midst of the Euro crisis, we socialized bank debt in an enormous amount, yeah? It's basically betrayal of the money of the people. It's nothing else. So it's wrong elite, elite choices in a way. And so if we were reasonable in taking the critique, you could say that the populism, even if people understand the complexity of the Euro mechanism, yes or no, but they had a sense that their uh, people were fooling around with their money. As in essence, yeah? So populism as a reaction to wrong elite choices and sort of the self-critique of the elites who did that, I think that really comes into, into game here and I think it should not be, it should, set, it should be set loud. Slavomir, so. last qu question for you then. Um, the way Western European countries um, uh, like the Netherlands or, 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 or Germany, you know, wagging the finger at Eastern Europe, the way they respond to the illiberalism in countries like Poland and Hungary, how does that play out uh, in, for instance, Poland? Obviously not well, but what will be the long-term result of, you know, um, th 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 speaking to the Poland, Polish like, a, like, a, like, an, like an adult? It depends who, because like, <coughs> actually, of course, crucial uh, country, um, <coughs> Germany. The problem with Germany is, you know, who is the biggest trade partner for Germany today? The biggest trade China. partner for Germany, absolutely not, is four Visegrad countries, twice as much as uh, twice larger than China and France. I have and also, no, no, it's absolutely well. It's really this is this is how we uh, really how it is. You have three hundred billion sixty-four uh, euros uh, a year. And the, with France is 167, with China is 170. The problem is even uh, even even broader because the growth is nine percent each year. So Germans have to tolerate what's going on in Visegrad countries because this is the best business, much better than with any and geographically close, well educated, cheap but they uh, power. Do speak out. Uh, they do speak out, but not to really, uh, not to, to harm person. too much. Yes. I mean, from my perspective, uh, well, if the Horst Zehofer, but not only him, uh, says after the election of Viktor Orban, this is, welcome our friend, he says even, uh, it's a civic conservatism that won in, 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 in Hungary. Liberal democracy or not liberal democracy, for sure it was not civil conservatism that started anti-Semitic campaign, that, all, that, that damaged all this, all this thing. Um, I, I'm going to say something consensual. That's what I said at the beginning, that uh, at the end of the day, I cannot imagine democracy that will survive to be, 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 uh, uh, without these liberal uh, values as respect for minorities, respect for the... Uh, for the judiciary, et cetera, even if they are liberal tradition. The difference also is, we, we mentioned um, the, the centralization, centralization, which is very important. And actually, this is the only reform that was really successful in Poland. And this is why Kaczynski can rule, uh, but 
European funds, huge part of power is uh, in is locally, and 15 out of 16 voivodeships are still ruled by the opposition. The problem is that in when Trump says something, the, and court says it's not possible, Trump respects. When Kaczynski says something, no matter if it is centralized, decentralized, whatever, he doesn't print the ruling of the judges, for example. He doesn't respect it. Checks and balances, which here you, I hope, agree it's a part of liberal tradition, work in the Western Europe, doesn't work in Eastern Europe. Yeah. Very clear. Let's go to audience questions. I see a lady over here, the first or the second row. I will make it short, but I would like to come back to what uh, Ulrike said, because it's always a topic that disappears, and that is the gendered fights under populism and under fundamentalist movements, because peop uh, women elsewhere in the world have already decades problems with fundamentalist women, uh, uh, movements. But I think uh, my question is, how can we challenge our own misogyny in the Netherlands, in Northern Europe, because there are some contradictions between populists in the Netherlands who have the Muslim uh, as scapegoat and are protecting so-called the, the oppression of Muslim women, and, uh, but at the same time are men uh, demanding their own masculinity back because they were losing and they will have the right to humiliate women. These contradictions are in the same movement, in the same party, but public, uh, 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 public opinion and the mainstream media are very... Uh, no, don't talk about it. How can we put that on the agenda? Because it's part of the problem we are discussing today. And not just in, in, in the Netherlands, I suppose, you, you feel? I mean, if we look at it a little broader than just the PVV or the... the Look, uh, I'm not a gender specialist, but I think really it's one of the most latent sort of things because first we cannot discuss it openly in TV. Eh? You cannot open TV news seven o'clock sort of there's a gender battle going on and uh, la, but you need to frame it like populist movement in, uh, you know, Kaczynski abortion rights, whatever. Yeah, But I think there's something about getting control of the women and it comes sort of silently and uh, it comes even in countries like in Germany where we are reopening battles on abortion that we saw that we closed in the 70s and we open them not from the AfD, we open them from Jens Spahn, who is now a new minister of Mrs. Merkel. Yeah? But uh, if you see, for instance, the um, uh, campaign posters of the AfD, which was for the last elections, which were the pregnant women with a big uh, bauch, yeah? and there was sort of, we can do babies alone. This really sounds like, you know, birth battle, yeah? sort of no migrants, but own birth, yeah? own birth. And um, so there is a women question because if you don't have the women in control, then women don't give birth. They perhaps want to work or have no kids or whatever. Yeah. So this abortion is just strategic in any discourse of populism, uh, closed homogeneities, ethnic, and so you, you, if you want to make survive your people because the people is more important, then you need to have enough children. Yeah. And I think this is a really unfortunate sort of tendency of time. I don't have answers. I just know that uh, most of the populist parties are serving that wave. They are serving it, you know, like Kaczynski, or what's the Polish name of the Kaczynski gives, or not Kaczynski, but his government, uh, his marionette government, gives now 500 slotties to each Polish woman for each child, which is equivalent to the German Kindergeld, although the ratio from slotty to uh, euro is one to four. So basically it means it's four times as high as the German Kindergeld. Any, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but any average trained Polish woman yeah, can never earn as much as if she gets three children yeah, in sort of now the next year. So she will have a sort of salary which by de any decent standard of the job market she will not get in Poland. That will change Polish society in a few years more than any other regulation yeah, because the women obviously will go back to having children, will be dropping out of the workforce and then uh, you know whether the EU Commission comes in and that is what Jan Werner said with you know rule of law and uh, uh, let's do a very you know, <laughs> the EU hasn't turned around uh, on its own sort of circle, yeah, that Poland is a different country. And obviously it comes through the whim. So what is the answer? To be honest, I don't have an answer. But I do think that uh, always in this battle, <laughs> um, probably the women are split themselves, yeah, because th that is the problem of uh, nationalism then, that half of the women go with the nationalists, yeah, because they have this, you know, heroism, 
yeah, defense of the country. So the women are split, and even worse in these times, because the battles of the women are multiple slip split. If you then look, say, the battle for emancipation, which is abortion rights, but then you look with the Muslim women, fula or not fula, and you come into very dangerous sort of, uh, uh, sort of, are you, uh, because you're liberal and you don't want the scarf, yeah? So w what is the, uh, your emancipatory <coughs> claim, and where's the border of liberalism? And you can easily have sort of the splits into the gender community where some would defend that you should have no scar because that's a sign of illiberalism. Um, but then you could also say it's tolerance and then you have the battle among the women themselves. So very unfortunately, I don't have an answer. But what I, I just wanted to bring this thing in because I think it's one of the most latent um, because it, 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 it goes to the instincts, you know. I don't know whether you have been aware of the Sylvester party in Cologne, where m many German women apparently had been attacked by Syrians, refugees, yeah. And this was the outcry when it started that the Syrians we let in, where the nationalists started to yell that because Germany had opened the border, we have so many male young Syrians in, that now the German women are threatened. It took some months to reveal that out of these 500 women who apparently had been aggressed, there were only two or three left, and the others were basically faking. Yeah. So, but the the harm was done. The thing is, you couldn't withdraw this sort of out yell, and this um, mix between the sort of the refugee question and the gender question, I think, is one of the most burning things because it comes to uh, basically um, making the nationalist an argument for women in terms of um, protection, but against migrants. Yeah? So all this is totally intermingled, but uh, it's rare that you bring this openly into a discussion because we, we refrain, we, we, we are shying away from, from that. Thank you very much for the question as well. Over here. Yes, Sarah de Lange, professor of political science at the University of Amsterdam and one of the empirical colleagues that Jan Werner Müller referred to. Um, there has been a lot of talk about culture, about a liberal tradition, about uh, cultural uh, uh, culture wars, and I was wondering of about the role of institutions, uh, especially in explaining the differences between East and West. Because irrespective of the existence of a liberal tradition, it is a fact that um, political systems, party systems, are far less institutionalized in Eastern Europe and therefore simply more vulnerable, uh, which is also expressed, for example, in, in figures of low turnout in these countries, <coughs> etc. Um, and I had another comment. Um, there's been some talk about you know, the elite and their policies, their decisions, but of course there is another aspect to representation, which is actually the people populating our institutions. Um, and I think one of the failures of representation is also that our institutions are not populated by people that are recognizable uh, to different groups of voters, something that uh, Mark Bovens has referred to as the diploma democracy. So perhaps we don't only need the notion of the republic, but also that of the aristocracy to understand what's going on. S somebody in particular wanted to respond? I can, I mean, I, I have, uh, I would like to, but maybe if Jan wants I to give also. One, I give one sentence. I think my thesis would be we are in a post-institution world. And the thing is that institutions lose authority all over the place. By the way, all institutions, international institutions like IMF or World Bank or NATO or, what, you know, but also, say, Bundesbank, all these authority providers which we had in the past. So you can make a point that we are deconstructing the mediate, the, the institutions as mediator, which is the fact that the, the you know, the uh, direct democracy is no more institutions, post-party democracy, uh, liquid democracy, uh, uh, bl blockchain democracy, I mean, all this digital sort of thing, and I think we haven't figured yet out <laughs> what the digital sort of thing does to our institutions, but by any standards I would make a thesis that we are in a post-institution world because the institutions lack hierarchy and authority, and because the institutions lack that authority, we are going to the new leaders, yeah, which is no more Trump and a press person, space press books, but Twitter. Trump, Twitter, direct the people. No more White House press officer to, yeah? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So just, just two quick responses. So on the first one, I completely agree. Um, this is not just a cultural question. Um, checks and balances, in a sense, were not as institutionalized in Hungary once the constitutional court was gone. As an independent actor, there was almost nothing left. 
um, party systems are not as entrenched as they are in Western Europe. The question, though, in a sense, is, well, maybe Central and Eastern Europe is the future of Western Europe. So unlike the 90s narrative that, you know, we are obviously the future of them, it could be the other way around. And on the second point, and also picking up what Ulrike said, uh, and maybe very apropos, given who came to, to government this past, this past week, I agree there is a kind of crisis of traditional mediating institutions, mm -hmm. so political parties, but also the media itself. And I think Five Stars really is kind of a unique entity in Europe right now, because it's entirely built on the idea of rejecting these traditional mediating institutions. It calls itself an anti-party, and if you listen to Grillo, at least in the old days, he would not only criticizes the professional politicians, who of course are corrupt, it's also always the professional journalists. And he would then basically, I'm quoting more or less from memory, say, folks, it works like this, you tell me what's really going on via the blog, and I'll play the amplifier. Now, obviously, by now, people in Italy have figured out that it maybe isn't quite as simple as that, but it's a very strong suggestion that basically you can cut out the mediator, because the mediator is always going to be distorting. In certain, in certain ways. So in that sense, I think it's also very different, even though they're often equated, from Podemos, which by now I think is simply a relatively traditional left-wing party, or Syriza for that matter. This is something new. It's a bit of a cliche, of course, that Italy is always a laboratory. You know, Hitler modeled himself on Mussolini, and you know, it always happens there first, you know, first Berlusconi, then Trump. But I think this really is the thing to watch in terms of can this kind of new kind of entity work, or is it de facto gonna end in what I think some of us are suspecting, as simply online mass plebiscites, which have so no So it's good, it's good that this plays out, th this well Italian experiment. It's somebody, every one something everybody's yeah. watching. Oh, one recommendation, if you can buy, buy Disco Saro, is a new fancy book which has precisely the answer of this, because if you then do the block feed, and then we think that the algorithm basically takes the essence of out of all these blocks, yeah? What we are, we are living in is um, always repeating the past because you, uh, the more you gather data, data are always built on what we have experienced, yeah? Which means that if you go for a plebiscite on uh, data of the past, you are, we will be locked into the past. There will be no more space for new ideas. So Disco Saro is a super fancy, uh, easy to read sort of thing, which has precisely this. There is a fiction, 2040, we are figuring out the new Europe after a post-Civil War Europe, yeah? And a group of young students, the rebel students, are trying to do a plebiscitum with all these online devices, yeah? And they are going to with an algorithm to find the solution for the future to realize that if we, if we go back to data, we are locked into the past. Disco Sara. Disco Sara. Sorry, okay. Do you really want to exclude Eastern Europe? Sorry? <laughs> no. No. Why, why would I exclude Eastern Europe? I would like to answer that. No, please, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not here to exclude because, uh, anybody. I think that this was your, uh, this was your question, too, because really, I mean, this is the problem. That the, I know that our friend, Timothy Snyder, um, wrote a book that the institutions are really crucial. Uh, also, not, it's, it's not, uh, on, on tyranny is also about the same thing. And it's based on bloodlands because the bloodlands um, and black earth convince you that as long as institution exists, uh, we are more or less safe. And Jews and Holocaust is the best example. When the institutions beginning with the state were totally destroyed, the probability that the Jews will survive went from 50% to 5%. In France, more Polish Jews were killed than French Jews in France, only in France. Because things like citizenship, foreign policy, um, and, and other, other institutions, saving, they, they save you and they are very fragile. It's easy to destroy them, it's very hard to build them. The problem with Eastern Europe is exactly that the institutions are quite new. And, uh, be, and be, well, beginning with the most basic thing, cities, universities, trade unions, state. Uh, these are the institutions that we have to build to respect something that is 20 years old. It's a little bit different thing than to respect something that is 200 years ago. Um, so this is why it's much easier to reshape them, reform them, change them. If they, were, if they are brand new, why 
what, like what to, what is to really to to respect this is why i would like to reverse this philosophy uh, well proven by snyder saying that um um that that that, that like this is why exactly why the, the populism is much stronger here um than there Briefly, don't don't start with just one sentence because I've heard that <laughs> several times now and it never works out. They didn't say one. No, you didn't. You didn't. That's, uh, Not now. Also waste precious seconds, <laughs> like this sentence now. So, just one thing, because you asked about the American debate. Maybe one thing that is is, is interesting to observe also is that in a sense I think the American debate is caught in a very unfortunate dilemma. Liberals, in the broadest sense, are going to say we have to defend the institutions. And then parts of the left are going to say, but haven't you realized how these institutions are profoundly gendered and racist and how we can't really say, oh, in the US we've had a democracy for hundreds of years because we only transitioned to democracy in the South maybe 40, 50 years ago. And both sides in a certain way are right. And both debates need, need, to, be, need to be played out. The problem is you can't play them out in 140 characters. But ideally you bear both in mind as opposed to deciding between the two. And still I would make the argument that what Trump is really is a sort of elected feudalism, right? And Trump is the king who has a direct contact to his people. And the thing is not that he needs to be good to the people, but he just makes needs to say that he likes the people, yeah? America first. And I think there is a there is a factor of, you know, uh, I mean, also if we would go into a deeper uh, socioeconomic discussion of what is really happening, yeah? Uh, but there is a thing of elected feudalism, yeah? There is this, you, you, you need a leader, there's a, of Yasha Monk wrote the book, you, there's a strong tendency for strong leadership. It's, by the way, all male figures, just to make that little, yeah? Whether you do Macron or Or Orban or Putin or Kurz, uh, it's all these young, smart sort of men coming back, uh, or older men. Yeah. No, getting, well, we uh, have a gender balance in populism. So yeah, so and uh, I, I bet it's not Marine Le Pen coming in France, but Wauquiez. That, that is a very interesting argument. Yeah, the, the real the real danger is not sort of the the sort of the nasty populist, but the real populist turn. But the real danger is those who speak the same thing being less nasty. I think the real danger in the Netherlands is more Thierry Boudet than Rachwalders. In Austria, certainly Kurz the bigger danger than Strache. Yeah, so it's not the ugly type we would and, and so Marine Le Pen will not do it but Wauquiez probably yeah so uh, there's a thing here but coming back to Trump my real point is that we were about you know how do they get support and they get support through a democracy a formal democracy a formal majority and so on and so forth but there is a thing and that was your argument about uh, the establishment or say the money establishment not the mind establishment supporting these people yeah because they do not want to share in essence yeah so in in in, in that sense the the trick of the new populist wave is that it is a form of uh, making the refordalization we are all experiencing in the socio-economic sphere making that elected and there is a process behind, and that was Jan Werner's argument, that basically none of these leaders can rise without the basically support of the money establishment of their reciprocal countries. Alisa Weigel, because you mentioned it, but I tell you what, yeah, she runs through Frankfurt and she has the doors open, yeah? So, and, 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 and there is a, a real argument sort of who finances this? Where, where does the money co from, come from? And, uh, and uh, in the case of Ali Alisa Weigel, it's very easy, yeah? We have one final question uh, up in front here, the gentleman over there. Thank you, I hope the gender balance in questions is okay. Uh, my name is Robert Ciesler and I'm uh, one of the board members of the all the individual members, the European Liberal Party. And in our party we have the Citoyanos in Spain. And we are discussing now the east-west uh, division of uh, democracy, populism, liberalism. And I see, if I look at Citoyanos, I see them calling themselves liberals, but if they talk about the Catalans being prisoned, they get confused. They talk about law and the state of law. And I don't see this basic liberalism you were referring to that should be grounded in the West. So uh, I'm, I'm using this example of Citoyanos that I see this not automatically there in the West. And of course, Spain has a different difference. So I was very uh, curious what you think about that, because it's going to be the biggest party uh, soon. Um, well, my, my the, the problem is that uh, and it's a kind of a impression more than something that I really, um, that it's like, it's just an impression, but, but based on 
pure facts, if pure facts exist, um, and they don't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> fact comes from the Latin word facio facere feci factum, which means construct. Um, um, the thing is that, um, yes, in Spain is a very symptomatic thing. The new division that is appearing in Europe is right and populist right as a main division. You have it now, and it's like, you know, you have it in Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary now Spain, and you're going to have it soon uh, in Germany mm -hmm. when the left is gro going down, IFD is going up, and so they're always like, you know, trying to resist, okay? You're going to have it in France probably soon because Macron, is after giving the citizenship <laughs> to the refugee who saved the child, uh, <laughs> and like a, a, a month before passed the law, the most strict law, but I, I, and, also, and also the work in the... Uh, 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 fireman. Fireman. Why not university? Because the guy comes from Mali, it could, must be a physical work, right? <laughs> I mean, the, I'm, I pro I'm sure that the guy, if the guy would be from, I don't know, white, uh, some like more decent country, would never be sent to the... Fireman, fireplace, fireman, okay. Yeah, exactly. But he passed the law that it's most restrict law. Mm -hmm. And also, like, it, mean, financial minister, minister of economy, and prime minister, they both all are from the... Right. Right. So some, someone wrote that uh, had the right one, the, the president from the right side, you would have exactly the same economic program, okay? So... And unfortunately, this, this, this German 9 will shift both Macron and, and Merkel to the... And actually, even the, 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 the Italian, new Italian government is more right-wing than left-wing. Uh, and it's going to go... So, like, this is... This, I mean, Ciudados, this is actually the, 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 the good example and kind of a, like, Spanish pattern that, that the entire Europe will go to me. There was a very nice uh, uh, front page line in Le Canard Enchaîné, which is this ironical uh, sort of two days ago. Now we know that uh, Macron is ni left and ni left, uh, ni, ni gauche, ni gauche, but only right and right. <laughs> so. <laughs> final, final question. Because yeah, just thanks so much for, yeah, thank you for allowing me to make this point. Uh, Vasil Cherepan in Kiev, Ukraine. I think uh, what is really symptomatic in our today's discussion, what is missing somehow in our current political vocabulary, probably I, I may sound kind of uh, old-fashioned, um, but uh, I think uh, that uh, it was also, somehow Slavic mentioned it only, but uh, the missing element in today's uh, discussion is uh, the left. Uh, because usually we are blurring this left-right uh, divide, uh, political divide, but at the same time, it, it also explains a lot this east-west divide. Because what we have been observing during the last decades, it was continuous crash of the left. The, the working class has been abandoned by the left. Now it votes uh, for the right-wing populists. I think it's not by occasion that populists nowadays are mu uh, pretty often, more often connected to, to right-wingers, not to left. Yeah, so uh, uh, the left has also abandoned the middle class, and low middle class is also now on the side of right-wing populists. The left has abandoned populus as such, that's why populus b became uh, a right-wing. And uh, that's why what we saw in, in Germany, when, uh, when you have the uh, political center, like Merkel campaigning with the slogan, Gut und gerne leben, which, which is totally non-ideological, it's not a political claim, yeah, it's like, let's live nice and, uh, and well here. Uh, of course, you will get the, the uh, IFD in the parliament and the total crash of SPD and to the east-west divide it also this absence of the left uh, nowadays it also in the Eastern Europe it's very much connected with the uh, with the, uh, the left uh, in the past because that is exactly somehow because usually if you ask the, uh, the crucial question why the uh, right in populism is so harsh in the Eastern Europe and not so much in the West it is exactly because of the socialist past, because usually it's been explained that uh, that uh, people, th uh, those people are so much traumatized. They lived, they had this real socialism in their experience. That's why they can, they are not so get used to to democracy and so on. But it's basically the opposite. It's like what it, after the fall of the German uh, of the Berlin Wall, you had in in the Eastern Germany this principle did there had nie gegeben in Polish and in Ukraine now this decommunization, which is wiping out all the imagery 
history, all, all the traces of the socialist past, as, as if communism has never existed. This fight against communism is basically the, the reason why the, the far right is so severe in the Eastern Europe. So the more, the more you fight the leftist danger, the severeness, uh, the severe far right you will get at the end. For Germany, the answer is very easy because I mean that's the the re I mean for France it's even worse. The PS has disappeared, yeah. But for Germany, there is this really this cleavage when uh, you know when Schröder did the most uh, right wing economic policy and lost the left of the left, which is the split between Die Linke and SPD. They never got over it. But the real thing is shying away from admitting that they committed a mistake. Uh, and that is until today that Ol uh, Olaf Scholz uh, needs a black zero, which is the you know the weirdest invention in modern economy, but uh, uh, the left cannot, you know, cannot admit that probably the Hartz IV reforms were basically crashing the left in Germany first, but then in the rest of Europe. And I think the then mistake is that the, say, let's call them left or progressive intellectuals, yeah, are shying away from discussions about class and are always going into identity. So basically we make the intellectual work of the right. And I see this in Germany very clearly because now you have Thea Dorn and who have you, you know, all our uh, sort of lefty intellectuals who are now saying, oh, we should not leave the nation and the identity and the heimat to the right, so we need to occupy this, yeah? But in essence, what you end up with is that the right talks about heimat, identity and nation, and then the left says, we also need to talk about this, so we only talk about heimat, identity and nation, yeah? And so the left is no longer holding any emancipatory agenda, any claim for rights, uh, any claim for class, and if you say there are class divisions, I can tell you in Germany, I mean, obviously, yeah, we are working with, say, what would you call it, but gelenkte uh, Presse, yeah? I mean, if you look at statistics of unemployment and so, I mean, you may make the point that there is work behind. And, um, and so uh, the acceptance of class division in a public opinion mainstream is not allowed. So if you say there is inequality, you are not progressive, but you are basically left. And here's the point, there is one article which is very precise on this, is an academic article, but he makes a semantic analysis that what Ludwig Erhard would say in the 60s, Ludwig Erhard being from the CDU, for instance, that um, um, earnings uh, should be from companies um, uh, should be um, socialized, yeah? Today is only Sarah Wagenknecht saying this. Yeah? So it tells you the shift in the language is what to in, in the 60s Ludwig Erd would say in the best middle of society for CDU, today it's Sarah Wagenknecht and you say the same thing, you exclude it in the public discourse. And that is why the left is out. We have to leave it at this. I want to thank our uh, guests for coming today. It was very interesting. Um, Mr. Miller will be back. At the uh, at seven, uh, Paul Scheffer will be there as well. We'll continue the conversation, but look a little more. At least that's the intention. At um, uh, so solutions and how to proceed from here. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming, everybody. And please have a drink. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.